All right, how is everybody doing? Uh, welcome to my channel. This is uh, for educational purposes, and uh, we take a look at uh, ancient and modern theories of everything, all encompassing theories, um, holistic worldviews, uh, just things that can uh, kind of round you out and um, give you a one-stop shop and um, we try to go deep into them and show you the ins and outs and um, you know help you to employ them in your life uh, with your paradigm shifting and your um, awakening to 5d consciousness today is our 482nd video on the reciprocal system of theory from Dewey B. Larson. And uh, this is a system of theory, meaning that um, once you figure out how it works, it's an inner interlocking theory. It applies to all subjects. Um, you pretty much figure out how it works, and then you can apply it to whatever subject you'd like. Um, now, that is a pretty tall order. There's uh, a lot of ins and outs and a lot of details, a lot of um, unfamiliar thinking that you have to do, a lot of unlearning that you might have to do about how you thought that the, uh, you know, particularly the sciences um, were constructed. And, um, but if you uh, really learn the reciprocal system, then you can you pretty much own it for life and then you'll be able to use it in every aspect of your life. In 1959, Mr. Larson proposed his two fundamental postulates about how he believed the universe operated. And then um, he derived through a process of deduction, a theoretical universe about what the universe would look like if his uh, two postulates were correct. And then he uh, wrote some books um, that compared his theoretical universe with the measured empirical universe of the uh, legacy mainstream scientists uh, that they have uh, you know, acquired from their various laboratory and observatory experiments and have um, compiled in their table, scientific tables. And uh, we're looking at one of Larson's books here called, it came out in 1987. Uh, he died in 1990. But this book is called Basic Properties of Matter. And that's just what it is, mainly about chemistry. And it's about many of our, the basic properties of matter um, you know, the melting point and the specific heat and the compressibility. And Larson arrives at equations for all of these different expressions um, of matter. And um, then he plugs um, the matter, atoms and molecules into his equations. And then he compares his values with the values that have been um, tabulated in these various tables. Uh, we are in chapter 10 here, which is called electrical resistance. Now, um, I'm not going to get into all of the details of going through Larson's theory. I've done that uh, 474 different times. Um, so if you want to um, kind of uh, get a more detailed uh, overview of uh, how Larson's theory operates. Just watch one of my 470, my first 474 videos on this subject and the reciprocal system of theory um, that are all on that playlist. Uh, I will just uh, kind of read you off, or I don't have it in front of me, but um, recite to you the um, two postulates. Larson's reciprocal system 
uh, can also be called the universe of motion. And uh, Larson was one of the uh, few scientists who proposed to construct their universe upon motion rather than matter or energy or force. Larson goes with motion. And he says that the first postulate says that the universe um, is composed entirely of one component, motion, existing in three dimensions, in discrete units, and with two reciprocal aspects, space and time. And then the second uh, postulate is really just for um, how he's up going to apply his first postulate um, in order to get his theoretical universe. And that is that the universe conforms to the relations of ordinary commutative mathematics. Its primary magnitudes are absolute and its geometry is Euclidean. And um, I, I, don't, uh, I don't necessarily agree with the content of that second postulate, but I don't really think it matters that much. I think that second postulate is just for, uh, it basically is just saying, I'm using the um, accepted um, protocol of science. You know, I use math, I use geometry, I use logic, and that's what I'm using in order to arrive at my theoretical universe from my first postulate, which is that the universe is made out of motion, in particular, a kind of motion called scalar motion, which is a motion that has a magnitude and has no specific direction, uh, which you can envision using a um, balloon that you put dots on. And if you blow up the balloon, all the dots will be moving away from each other. And that is a, a motion that has no specific direction. Every, every dot is moving in every direction outward, every outward direction. And Larson calls that the progression. That's uh, in a universe of motion, this progression is always occurring. It's omnipresent and uh, eternal. Um, and so the progression is always occurring at all locations. And then that progression is the source of everything in Larson's universe. And um, manifestation really happens by reversing that progression and turning that outward movement of the balloon into an inward movement where all of the dots are moving toward each other. And that's analogous to uh, gravitation. So turning and matter, turning gravitation, turning the progression into gravitation is a process of manifestation. And then, um, you know, so that is the motion that the universe is constructed upon. And uh, that motion is also the relationship between space and time. Space and time have no specific um, um, existence in and of themselves. They only exist together in motion. Motion is a relationship between space and time that sets up a reciprocal relationship between space and time. Motion is basically a fraction with space or time as the numerator and time or space as the denominator. But motion is not just speed, um, but it is really all our speed or velocity would be the you know, directional form of, of uh, sc scalar speed. But then there is also all of the other scientific phenomena. They are all kinds of motion and they all uh, can be expressed in fractions of either time or time over space or space over time uh, with exponents. So it can be, you know, time to the third power, space to the third power, what have you. And the universe is three dimensional. Um, three dimensions of space, three dimensions of time, three dimensions of motion. These are not all the same. And I would really just say it's really three three because three is three plus zero so you know you're kind of really talking about four dimensions but the 
fourth dimension is a zero dimension. And so three plus zero equals three. So you have three dimensions. And uh, then everything, space, time, and motion also only are um, come in discrete units. You have to have a full unit of space before you have space. You have to have a full unit of time before you have time. Okay, uh, there's many other uh, aspects and ramifications of all that, uh, but that is for those four, our first 474 videos, if you'd like to take a look at that. We are going to try to get into the text here of chapter 10 on electrical resistance. We left off, uh, we're about to look at um, chapter, uh, table 25, which is internal pressures in resistance and compression. And so uh, Larson comes up with uh, an equation for the internal pressures. Uh, well, he says table 25 is a comparison of the internal pressures in resistance and compression for the elements included in the study. The symbols following or preceding some of the values indicates that there is evidence of a transition to or from a different internal pressure but the available data are not sufficient to define the alternate pressure level. And again, Larson has trouble here with these uh, resistance uh, measurements, electrical resistance measurements, because the scientific data that he's comparing his theoretical data to uh, is very uncertain. Um, he, he mentioned a number of reasons why that is. But, uh, you know, it's pretty hard to do a comparative study, uh, you know, comparing your theoretical system with the uh, observed and measured system when the observed and measured system isn't very accurate. And so, you know, this is a bugaboo of Larson's in particular for this study here of um, resisti uh, resistance, resistivity. Now, um, it's, it's pretty hard to read this table the way that um, my computer has it uh, um, configured. And um, I'm just trying to look through to see how Larson does, you know, whether his, um, his observed or his uh, calculated um, results are pretty much the same as the um, observed results and it's very difficult to really understand what he's what's going on here um, he's got the elements listed and then he's got a couple of numbers and then uh, he has I guess those are the calculated numbers and then in some cases a couple more numbers and those are the observed numbers but then he has them in a sequence like so for astatine, he gives you the two numbers, 274 and 548. But then um, next to that for the observed numbers are 274 and 548, but then also 822. And those are, you know, 274 times 2 and 274 times 3. So I'm not sure where he's coming from, but he's looking at the initial pressures. Uh, so where, I guess that just means that there can be multiple initial pressures depending upon certain factors. And it looks like all the numbers are either multiples or three halves of the first number that's, that's written. So... Um, you know, for gold, I guess that that's more of a factor of four over three gold. The number that he gives is 867, but then the uh, observed number is either 650 or 857 or 867. Sorry. Um, I don't really get this cause he seems to have the numbers all exactly right. Um, but he doesn't always have the x, uh, the multiplier there. Uh, let's see what he says about it. 
the amount of difference between the two columns of the table should not be surprising. The atomic rotations that determine the AZY factor, now just keeping in mind that uh, in Larson's system, uh, the universe of motion, all of the atoms are combinations of motions. And every atom is really got three numbers, uh, A, B, and C. The A number is a two-dimensional rotation. The B number is a secondary two-dimensional rotation. And the C number is a one-dimensional rotation in the opposite scalar direction, and that is optional. And those are the three numbers that Larson uses to make his calculations here. But he, for pressure um, purposes, um, he and temperature, he uses AZY numbers, which are similar, but not the same. And, um, you know, so these are the numbers that he's using to move from that outward motion of the balloon to the inward motion of the balloon. That's how you manifest, is taking that outward motion, which is the source, and first reversing the motion and then moving the motion inward. And so those are done through rotations, also vibration and rotation. Okay, so the atomic rotations that determine the AZY factors are the same in both cases, but the possible values of these factors have a substantial range of variation. And the influences that affect the values of these, of these factors are not identical. In view of the participation of the electrons in the resistivity relations and the large impurity effects, neither of which enters into the volume relations, some difference in the pressures at which the transitions take place can be considered normal. There is, at present, no explanation for those cases in which the internal pressures indicated by the results of the compression and resistance measurements are widely divergent. But differences in these specimens can certainly be suspected. Table 26 compares the relative resistances calculated from equation 10 2 with Bridgman's results on some typical elements. The data are presented in the same form as the compressibility tables in Chapter 4 to facilitate comparisons between the two sets of results. This includes showing the AZY factors for each element rather than the internal pressures. But the corresponding pressures are available in Table 25, which we just looked at. As in the compressibility tables, Values above the transition pressures are calculated relative to an observed value as a reference level. The reference value utilized is indicated by the symbol R following the figure given in the calculated volume. Calculated in quotes. So here, table 26 gives the relative resistance under compression. And I believe that he earlier said that the relative resistance isn't really the number he's looking for. He's looking for an expression that gives you um, the relative resistance is, I believe, the resistance that occurs at a specific temperature. Um, but, you know, this gives the relative resistance under compression. So it shows hmm, the so instead of temperature, it's under a specific amount of pressure. But the uh, numbers are all written up the same way they were in chapter four, where it give you know, like the maximum volume is 1.000. And then as the compression goes up, the number goes down because that's the volume 
the 1.00 is the volume. And, you know, when you put on um, a certain amount of pressure, um, that starts to decrease that volume. Um, but I don't really see any type of indication of resistance here. So, a relative resistance. Let's see what he has to say about this table. In those cases where the correct assignment of AZY factors and internal pressures above the transition point is not definitely indicated by the corresponding compressibility values, the selections from among the possible values are necessarily based on the empirical measurements and they are therefore subject to some degree of uncertainty. Agreement between the experimental and the semi-theoretical values in this resistance, uh, resistance range therefore validates only the exponential relation in equation 10-2 and does not necessarily confirm the specific values that have been calculated. The theoretical results below the transition points, on the other hand, are quite firm, particularly where the indicated internal pressures are supported by the results of the compressibility measurements. On this basis, the extent of agreement between theory and observation in the values applicable to those, elect, uh, those elements that maintain the same internal pressures through the full 100,000 uh, kilogram per square centimeter pressure range of Bridgman, uh, Bridgman's measurements is an indication of the experimental accuracy. The accuracy thus indicated is consistent with the estimates made earlier on the basis of other criteria. Inasmuch as the difference in the form of the compressibility equation, PV squared equals K, pressure times the square of the volume equals a constant. And that of the pressure resistance equation, which is P squared R equals K, is a requirement of the general reciprocal relation between space and time. Um, now, I don't exactly get where that's coming from. Uh, I don't know if you do the dimensional analysis on that, and that's where you get this, uh, because... Uh, this is basically substituting the volume for the resistance. That's the only, well, not the only distance, the difference in the equation. Now, pressure in the second equation is taken to the second power, whereas in the first equation, it's only in the first power, whereas volume is in the second power in the first equation, and it is replaced by resistance in the second equation. Now, volume is s to the third power. Pressure is time over space to the fourth power. Resistance is time to the second power over space to the third power. So, I don't quite get uh, what he's saying here. Um, the joint verification of these two equations is a significant addition to the mass of evidence confirming the validity of this reciprocal relation, the cornerstone of the quantitative expression of the theory of the universe of motion. Um, so I hate to leave you hanging, but he's left me hanging. I don't quite um, maybe to go back and look this over again, um, how this exactly um, is a um, reciprocal relation. 
Um, I think he does explain it. Um, Because he goes, he goes through the theory, as in the compressibility equation, the symbol P in this expression refers to the total effective pressure. Yeah. Okay. And um, I can understand the second power part because that's coming from the time region. Normally, Boyle's law is PV equals K or uh, PV equals E, energy equals pressure times volume. Uh, K maybe comes in if you are just um, holding the temperature at a constant. And if you are in the time region, which is in, in the region inside a unit of space, then the um, volume can be taken to the second power. And that's what happens in the um, original form of, uh, form of Boyle's, Boyle's Law, or that first equation, the uh, PV, or now PV squared, equals K. And, but now we're going with re resistance. And he says... Because the movement of electrons, electrons are rotating units of space, moving through matter. Uh, you can use something like effervescence to kind of uh, visualize that. Although the space, the electrons are not three-dimensional. They're really, you know, they are uh, rotating units. So they are you know flat but think of the concept of effervescence where you have a bubble moving through a liquid you know what moving upward in a liquid that is kind of analogous to the idea of a, a hole or a, a unit of space moving through matter and uh, because the movement of electrons or space through matter is the inverse of the movement of matter through space, the interregional relations applicable to the effect of pressure on resistance are the inverse of those that apply to the change in volume under pressure. So that's where he's getting this inverse relationship from. The reciprocal relation is the um, is that the resistance, the relations applicable to the effect of pressure on resistance are the inverse of those that apply to the change in volume under pressure so see right there Larson says all of that in one sentence and I would have really just wished that he would have uh, expounded on that uh, over a couple pages and explained every step that he's going through there um, because I I can see that this is the key uh, to understanding this, but I can't quite make the leap here from, and maybe you can, or you can explain it to me. The movement of electrons through space, uh, or electrons through matter, is the inverse of the movement of matter through space. I get that. And because of that, uh, the internal read interregional relations applicable to the effect of pressure on resistance are the inverse of those that apply to the change in volume under pressure. I just don't make that leap. I don't see that reasoning. Now the next sentence is said, we found in chapter 4 that the volume of a solid under compression conforms to the relations PV squared 
equals k, which is fine. That's uh, in the time region. And um, volume of a solid under compression. Okay, so that is, so he's saying that there is an inverse of that with the resistance equation. And so he then, uh, by reason of this, of the inverse nature of the electron movement, the corresponding equation for electrical resistance, therefore, is P squared R equals K. And, you know, I see that pressure is common in that equation, and the volume is being swapped out for the uh, resistance. And that, that moves the pressure into the uh, square, ma uh, making it a square um, quantity. But I do not see, I'm just not making that leap from, because the movement of electrons through matter is the inverse of the movement of matter through space. The effect of pressure on resistance is the inverse of the change in volume under pressure. Pressure has some kind of effect on resistance. And somehow that is analogous to the movements of electrons through space. I mean, electrons through matter, through time. While the change in volume under pressure is somehow analogous to the movement of matter through space. Okay, well, if anybody can figure that one out, please let me know. Um, but I have to think about it. Maybe I'll um, put that into my meditation and uh, mull it over, see what happens. But on the other hand, sometimes when you just keep reading and you just accept that you don't understand it, Larson will say something later on that will clear it up. So that that's happened a lot, and we'll hope it happens this time. Thanks for tuning in today, and have a great day. We'll start with Chapter 11 tomorrow, which is on thermoelectric properties.